in this week's portion, Mishpotim. Vela Mishpotim, I shall toss him with Nehem. These are the laws that you should present before them, you should place before them. So over here, in Rashi, with Nehem, he cites the Gemara, which is also the Midrash. You should present the laws before them. Below Lefnei Ovdi Kochot Bazolos, the person goes to a court, he should go to a Jewish court and not to a secular court. Even if you know factually, the secular law and the Jewish law is identical. Same law. person goes and damages another individual. There's a liability to fully compensate the person, full restitution, identical law. You're not permitted to go before the non-Jewish court. You have to go to the Jewish court. You should not go to the, their courts. Because if you bring a Jewish case, which has to be adjudicated before a non-Jewish court, you're desecrating the name of God. And you're esteeming the name of idolatry to give it praise. Shenemar, as it says in the Pesach, a verse in the Torah, our rock is not like their rock, and our enemies are plilim, when our, our enemies are our judges, this is, this is what? This is a testament when we elevate what they believe in. So by going to a non-Jewish court, although the law is identical, you're esteeming and valuing their God, their values, and whatever it may be. Therefore, it's considered a desecration of God's name. And how is it a desecration of God's name? Factually, it's identical. I choose to go a secular court rather than to a Jewish court. The ruling is identical ruling. God agrees. It's correct. This is justice. Not, nothing more, nothing less. So why is it considered Chil Hashem? It's desecrating Hashem's name, God's name and you're giving special esteem and value to what they believe in. We just read about Kabbalah Satora, Sinai. What happened at Sinai? God spoke to every Jew. We find that before the giving of Torah at Sinai, Hashem instructs Moshe that all men and women, husband, couples, must separate from their spouses. Because they must accept the Torah in a state of purity. So therefore, if they should cohabit within a certain period of time, the semen would contaminate the woman. So even if she would go to, to the mikveh to immerse herself, if the semen would come out of her body, she would become contaminated. So therefore, a three-day period, since after th three days, the semen becomes putrid and the child cannot be conceived from that semen any longer. Therefore, it does not contaminate. So was, there was a three-day separation period that had to separate and only then were they definitely in a state of purity that they were able to accept the Torah. Why? And what happened after the Torah was given? Hashem says to Moshe, tell them to return to their families. Let them go back to their tents to their wives but you must remain with me you must remain with me means Hashem was saying to Moshe you're not permitted to go back to your wife they could go back to their spouses you cannot go back to your spouse now why at the time of the giving of the Torah the Jews themselves had to be in the, the state of purity for what reason now at Sinai what happened at Sinai God communicated with every Jew when I Hashem presented the Aseris Adibros, the Ten Commandments to us. This was the presence of every Jew that existed at that particular moment. Did we... God's communicate with a human being is what? That's a prophecy. The concept of prophecy is God communicates with man. The prophet communicates in one of two ways, either in a sleep state or in a wake state. The only Navi who ever prophesied in a wake state was Moshe Rabbeinu. 
that's referred to as ponim el ponim, face to face, in a wake state. Every other prophet is what? Is bachalom. It's in a sleep state. At Sinai, every Jew prophesied in a wake state. When you prophesy in the wake, wake state, it's not only the communication is to the person's neshama, to his soul, but rather his body, his physical faculties, and his physicality is involved in that communication. So if a person, his physicality is contaminated, he's not qualified for this communication. Of course, they had to be in a wake state. Ponim el ponim. Adabirbom. I spoke to them face to face, to every Jew. Now, why did God have to speak to every Jew face to face? For what reason? So the Sifarno explains in last week's reading that the whole concept that God, that a human being is able to prophesy in the states, in a wake state, it's something which is so alien. The whole concept is so unacceptable because how could the physicality of a person be so spiritualized to have the capacity to receive that level of communication? The neshama, the soul which is spiritual, it has, relatively speaking, unlimited capacity. Its, its essence is spiritual. But the body which is physical and earthy, how's it able, how does it have the capacity to receive that communication? Therefore, said so that's the case, they can't accept Moshe Rabbeinu's level of prophecy unless they experience it themselves. Because Moshe factually was spiritualized to that degree. But they had no relevance to understand that. So therefore, God had to give them that personal experience, although they were not qualified to prophesy in a wake state, for them to accept Moshe's level of prophecy. The Moshe Rabbeinu is what? Is Ponim El Ponim is face to face the wake state. So therefore, at Sinai, not only they had to be physically pure, not only because their prophecy was going to be face to face, so after Sinai, Hashem says to Moshe, tell them to go back to their families. Because now it's been established that the concept of face to face prophecy in a wake state is possible because they experience themselves. Moshe Rabbeinu, he continues in that level. Therefore, Moshe has to remain with God. You must remain with me. You're not permitted to go back to your wife. Because Moshe Rabbeinu, whenever he prophesied, it was always in a wake state, not in a sleep state, for this reason. What is the basis for the, for the authenticity and the immutability of Torah? That it's the Word of God. How do we know that? So the Rambam writes in the laws of Yesodia Torah, this is the fundamentals of Torah, that when the Jews stood at Sinai, they witnessed Hashem speaking to Moshe openly. So it's not something which it came through testimony or it's hearsay, but rather we, each Jew at Sinai witnessed this himself. Fully awake in a prophetic state, we openly heard God speaking to Moshe. So how do we know Moshe is God's spokesman? Because we see, we experience firsthand, each one of us, in a wake state, how God chose Moshe to be a spokesman. As we heard him say, Moshe, go tell them such and such. Once that's been established, although we didn't hear everything, but if God openly chose him to be a spokesman, Moshe is the credible spokesman of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of God. Therefore, what does Hashem say after Sinai? B'cho yamid olam. From now going forth, they will believe you for, forever that you are, that your word is the word of God. When you speak in my name, your word is the word of God. Because God, Hashem, openly in our presence, in a wake state, witnessed how Hashem was speaking to Moshe. Go tell them such and such. So if Hashem chose Moshe to be a spokesman. Moshe is the chosen spokesman of Hashem. So now when Moshe speaks in the name of Hashem, He's a credible spokesman of Hashem. That's how we know. So therefore, every word of the Torah, when we speak about it's tor tor Torah's Moshe, it's, it's Torah's Hashem. When we find that Korach and his community, they attempted to usurp the authority of Moshe. And what did they claim? That it's something which he created himself. It was the word of God. And then the earth opened up and swallowed the community into the ground. The Gemara tells us in one location that there was one of the rabbis of the Talmud. He met an Arab, and an Mar Arab says to him, I want to sh show you something. And he takes him to a location in the desert where there was a crevice in the ground. 
and there was smoke coming out of the crevice. And he says, put your ear to the ground. And the person puts his ear to the ground, and he hears people in unison saying, Moshe MS, Vetoroso MS. Moshe is true, and his Torah is true, and we are liars. And this is Adas Korach in Gehenim, in spiritual hell. This is, this is Korach Vadoso. That's what they're saying. Moshe Emes Toroso Emes. Why is Moshe Emes Toroso Emes? He tried to usurp it. He tried to deny truth. He was swallowed up by the ground. Korach and his whole community. So now, you have two laws which are identical. When we hear, do not steal, a Jew is not permitted to damage, to be damaged is restitution, which is logical. What is the basis for that? Is it because it's logical? It's rational. The reason why it's true is because it's the Word of God. It has nothing to do with... We understand that a society cannot exist unless we legislate and we promulgate laws. It has nothing to do with this. The reason why every activity and every aspect of a Jew's life is bound by law, it has nothing to do because they're rational or irrational. It has nothing to do with this. Why is it you're not permitted to kill? Because God says you're not permitted to kill. Why are you not permitted to steal? Because God says you're not permitted to steal. So we speak of ethical, unethical. What, what determines ethical, unethical? It has nothing to do with our intelligence or our value system, that it's our quality of person. Nothing to do with this. The Jew, it all begins. What exactly is the word of Hashem? What did Hashem say in this aspect or in that aspect? whether it's our time constraints, our obligations within certain periods of time, our behavior, our interactive behavior, man to man, man to God, it has nothing to do with what, we, what we've come up with. But rather, everything is bound by the dictates and the parameters which Hashem set at Sinai for the Jew to function. When the non-Jew, he may come up with the same law. What's the root of that law? It has nothing to do with the Word of God. Because we understand stealing is wrong because a society can't survive. If people don't respect one another's ownership rights, it's impossible the world could continue unless you have, unless you have justice. It may be true, but that's not the reason why the Jew is bound by all these laws. Why are we bound by the laws? Because it's Dvar Hashem, because it's the Word of God. The non-Jew, he promulgates his laws based on his own understanding. That's the difference. But why is that? If you go to the secular court, although their law is identical to our law, it's considered mechal Hashem. You're desecrating God's name. You're giving value to them. But they're right. They're on the right track. We concur. We agree. It's the exact same law. It doesn't make... But what, where, what is their law rooted in and what is our law rooted in? Our law is rooted in something which is eternal and permanent as God. Their law is rooted in what? In their rational intelligence. That's what it's rooted in. What is the value of rational intelligence? So it's interesting. The Rambam, in the laws of idolatry, of Avodah Zorah, writes, Svarim Rabim Chibru Ovdei Kochovim, Babu Doso, the many works that were authored by Gentiles regarding this service, how one serves idolatry. Hech ikar how does one, what is the essence of its service? Mamaseho, how does one act in, regarding it? What, is, what are its parameters? Sivona, Kodesh Baruch Hu, Shalikros, Bosnas, Farm Klau. There's a Torah commandment, a Jew is not permitted to read these word, works of idolatry. All these aspects. Lo nahari bo, we're not permitted even to reflect on them. No aspect of what, what it represents. You're not permitted even to look at the form of the idol. You know, a person wants to admire the workmanship of an idol. You're not permitted because that is idolatry. Shinemar, as it says there, you're not permitted to turn towards idols, towards idolatry. And it says regarding idolatry, any aspect of idolatry, you may seek out their gods. You never know the degree of influence. You have any degree of interest, 
you may be drawn after it. It arouses curiosity. How did, why did they do it? They're intelligent people. They're rational people. They're productive people. Why did they? That arouses one's curiosity. Even if a person doesn't actually serve it, being curious causes one to gravitate towards it. Lasus Kamoshenos and ultimately could lead to what they do. Shlem of Esek King. Gamoni, you may also do it. Then he says, the Rambam. When we speak about a Jew is not permitted even to consider even a thought to consider or have any interest in idolatry. Any type of thought which ultimately causes a Jew to annul any of the fundamentals of Torah, any such a thought, we're not even permitted to think about these things, even to consider. We shouldn't in any way be distracted to that. A person says, you know, learning is questioning. We have a right to question. You only have right to question up to a point. Beyond that point, you have no right to question. Because certain questions, ultimately, if you focus on that question, it could lead to what? To heresy. It could lead to denial of God. What's the reason why? Why can't you just think of anything or reflect or consider anything, even if it's not idolatry, if something is bothering you? Like he said, something is a fundamental regarding the human intellect. We speak about IQ, intelligence quotient. Let's say a person has 120 IQ and they have another person that has a 220 IQ. The person with the 120 IQ is not going to be able to grasp what the 220 IQ, the levels of understanding that he can't. Why? He understands. He's limited. And let's say you have a person with, it's possible, with a 500 IQ. His, the, the, the scope of the greater IQ is beyond the one with even the ingenious IQ. Because the different levels of what? Of grasping. So everybody understands, regardless of what level of genius a person may have, there's limitation to what we could understand. So if a person is limited in his intelligence, one moment you consider things, the ne next moment you may not consider it. Because no one ever comes upon absolute clarity where it's dependent on his, on his IQ. The only way we could come upon something which is definite truth, if factually it's definite truth. What's, fact, what's factually definite truth? Where it's not based on your intelligence. As he says, Neishadato shal odem ketzoro. One's intelligence is limited. This is Ramam's words. V'lo kol adeo shichol lahasik ha'emes laburio. Not all minds are able to fathom truth on an absolute level. V'mimoshech acher odem acha machshavos libo. If a person allows himself to gravitate after his feelings and his thoughts, Nimsa Machris Olam, ultimately he'll destroy the world. Lafikot because of his limitation, he has limitation with his, within his intelligence, Ketzad, for instance. Pamim Yosur Achra Chavim. One moment he feels, maybe idolatry has some validity to it. Then he realizes, no, that it's flawed. It's flawed. And therefore he considers, only there's only the unity of God. Shema hu shema eno. Maybe yes, maybe no. A person, the essence of a person always vacillates. Of course, you never come upon something in the absolute. If you put your head in the fire, it's absolute. You get burned. That's fact. So anybody who knows that fire burns and understands that he's not putting his hand in the fire, that's absolute. But the truthfulness of God, the unity of God, how do we know that? Well, I figured it out. It makes sense to me. It's rational. It's rational as, as much as it make, makes sense. But factually, there may be endless other variables which you may not be aware of, and that may cause, at a later date, you may, may question what you believe initially to be truth, truthful. And as a result of this, a person, just based on his intellect, 
course, he's a seeker of truth, may end up with falsehood, with idolatry. He stopped me at Malamala, Malamata, Malifni, Malochar. Upami bin Hu Shemi Emishemi Eno. Prophecy. Was it? Is prophecy true or not true? Upami Batora Shemi Minasham Shemeno. It makes sense, it's divine. You know, all you have all these various uh, <coughs> seminars to prove to prove the divinity of Torah as they have the codes. How's it possible? You never know. You know, with computers, you could come up with anything. <coughs> Figure out all kinds of things. But does that really make sense? It has to be divine. Then, if you have a conflict of interest of whatever it may be, it's not so simple. That it's absolutely truthful. Maybe it's not. So ultimately, where does it lead to? It leads to heresy. A Jew is not permitted to veer if there's heart or if there's eyes. We say this in the third paragraph of Shema. Klomar. We're not permitted to be gravitated after our minds which have limitation. We should think for a moment that through our intellectualism we're able to fathom absolute truth through where it's based on our intellect. If a person gravitates after his intellect, what I understand, I accept what I don't, and I have a right to question, ultimately it leads to heresy. That's heresy. Even though you're not a heretic yet. But if that is your perspective, I'm an intellectual, and what I could intellectually grasp, I accept, and what I have difficulty with, it puts limitation on it, that's heresy. Although this negative commandment causes a person to be literally removed from existence, from the world to come, he forfeits his world to come, nevertheless he's not subject to the corporal punishment. So what's the difference? The Gentile, how does he come upon the laws which are essential to maintain society? Do not steal. Damaging. Respecting one's property rights. All these laws. They promulgate. They legislate these laws. But what, what are they rooted in? Are they rooted in truth? Or are they rooted in rational human thinking? That's intellect. That's for the non-Jew, it's good enough. For the Jew, what is the basis for his, for his code of behavior? Absolute truth. We prophesy, we were openly, God allowed us to openly prophesy in the wake state to witness Moshe being God's spokesman. That every word of Moshe is the word of Hashem. So, what is the basis for the authenticity of Torah? We, it has nothing with our intellect. We witness firsthand in a wake state this is something which is irrefutable under any circumstance. That Moshe is God's spokesman. Every word of Moshe is what? Is Emes. Moshe Emes Toros Emes. And we are Badoim. We are liars. That's Korach Vadoso. So therefore, when you go to the non-Jewish court, what are you giving value to? It, but it's the same law. It's a Chil Hashem. Because what you're giving up to go there, you're acknowledging... What the human intellect? What the human intellect has nothing to do with the truthful, truthfulness of Torah. Nothing. That's firstly. Secondly, you're esteeming what they represent. What do they represent? You're giving value to rational thinking. Of course, that's the basis for the law. Because you go to a Jewish court. Well, it's, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's a totally different level of representation. The Jewish court represents d divine. Irrefutable, immutable, the word of Hashem. What the secular court has nothing to the word of God. Sometimes they come upon truth, sometimes they don't. But what is the basis for the truth? It's their own intellect. Why did Odom Rishon, even though he knew what the word of Hashem was, why did he eat of the Eitz of Das? God says, don't eat of the tree of knowledge. The moment you eat of the tree of knowledge, you'll be subject to death. Somehow he rationalized. He ate of the tree of knowledge. He ate. So the Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin, when he ate of the tree of knowledge, 
he became a heretic. What do you mean he became a heretic? A person who was that level of absolute clarity. God openly, he was in the, he was, he was in the Garden of Eden. This is pre-sin. He was told, do not eat of the tree of knowledge. So how do you ignore the word of God? For that moment, God can't exist. Of course, if God could, it does exist. And you're in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, how do you eat? A person has the ability to block God out of his, mem uh, out of his mind, out of his life, as if God doesn't exist. So therefore, the Gemara says, the Talmud tells us in Sanhedrin, at that moment, Minhoyo, he was a heretic. Of course, otherwise he couldn't have eaten of the tree of knowledge. Now, it's interesting, the Rambam rules that to be from the Hasidi Umas Olam, to be from the righteous nations of the world, to have a share in the world to come, the Sheva Mitzvah Noach, the seven Noahide laws, it's not enough to believe, to be bound by them, because they were passed down from Noach, from Noach, they called ne Noahide laws, but rather because they were given at Sinai that the non Jew is bound by the seven Noahide laws. But if the if the Shev Mitzmei Noach and they abide by them, what difference does it make if it's from Sinai or it's from Noach? Pre Sinai, how did we know a prophet was a prophet? How did we know a prophet was a prophet? The Rambam writes that a prophet to prove that he's authentic prophet, that God communicated to him. Just telling he's a prophet, that's not sufficient. That doesn't give him any credibility to be a prophet. He has to do two things. Firstly, he has to perform a miracle, a supernatural act. In addition, he has to forecast the future, and the event that he forecasts happens. So if both of these things happen, the revealed miracle and the event that he forecasts takes place, he's established as a true prophet. So the Rambam says, but maybe the revealed miracle, the supernatural act which he did, he did through sorcery. How do we know this is the act of Hashem, the act of God? As he says, the reason is, because just as it says, when you have evidence in court, the Torah says, if you have two credible witnesses and you interrogate them, you could even put a person to death based on their testimony, even though it's possible they rehearsed in advance, they went through every aspect of rehearsal that they should be able to be interrogated and seem to be truthful witnesses. The reason why you accept them as truthful witnesses is because that's what the Torah says. That if witnesses come and they present themselves and they're credible and you interrogate them and they're able to pass the interrogation, you accept them as witnesses. The same thing. It's possible it's, it's sorcery. But Hashem says that if the witnesses themselves come, if the Navi presents, does a supernatural act and forecasts the future, even though theoretically it's possible it's sorcery, you accept him as a credible Navi, as a credible prophet. But how do you know that? How do you know that criteria is accepted even though theoretically it's possible that it's sorcery? Because God said to Moshe at Sinai that if the prophet meets these, these criteria, he's established as a credible prophet. So the basis for that is what? What is the source of that? Of course, we openly prophesied at Sinai in a wake state that God chose Moshe to be a spokesman and these are, this is the word of Moshe, which is the word of Hashem. Pre-Sinai, if a prophet would come and he would act in a way which seems to be he's connected to God, what is the basis for that understanding? That's, all, that's all our own evaluation. That's our presumption. It seems to be that he's a prophet of God. Why? Because he performed an, a supernatural act. He forecasted the future. But do you know the truth? Nobody ever established. That's your presumption. That's your evaluation of the person. Maybe, in fact, he's a sorcerer. And he's really misleading you. So prophecy until Sinai was based on what? On evaluation, resumption, based on the fact it seems to be, but it's not 100%. So until Sinai, other than the prophet himself knowing that he's the prophet, because God communicated to him, anyone else, how does he know his word is the word of God? You don't know. You presumably, we're presuming it's the word of God, but it's not absolute. When did it become absolute? Sinai going forward, that's absolute. Pre-Sinai, there was nothing absolute. 
It's a presumption. So therefore, at Sinai, the laws, the seven Nahid laws, were given that what, what the non-Jew is bound to. So if the non-Jew doesn't accept the Noahide laws, because it was, it was Sinai, it was transmitted at Sinai, what's the basis for his performance of, 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 the, of the abiding by the Shev Mitzvah Noah, the seven Nahid laws? It's not rooted in truth. It's not rooted in absolute. It's presumption. But to have a share in the world to come, it's not sufficient. It has to be absolute, as we're saying now. It has to be absolute. But within the Shev Mitzvah Noach, the laws of Mishpatim, the laws which pertain to setting up a judicial system, their parameters, they could, do, they could legislate within the, those parameters whatever they choose to legislate. They must have a judicial system. That's maintaining a society. But the laws which are within that system, that's up to the, themselves whatever they choose to promulgate. Thus, every aspect of law, except in, in less defenses, that's all divine. That's rooted in truth. There's a law, a Jew's not permitted to enter the Torah, we're not permitted to detract from the Torah. So how do, how do they legislate fences? Well, we speak about siyogim. Every rabbinic prohibition is a fence. The answer is the fence is not adding. The fence is protecting. If they want to come up with a 614th mitzvah, that's adding to the Torah. But that's only if the mitzvah has no relevance that law has no relevance to protect the Torah. The Torah encourages making fences. Asu mishmeris le mishmarti. Make a fence to protect my law. That's what the Torah wants. But again, that's not adding, that's protecting. The non-Jew, he legislates laws. He can do whatever he wants. As long as it's within the parameters of the seven Nohide laws. The exact same law, if it's be presented in a Jewish court, what's, it, so what's the source of that? That's Torah Sashem. If it's a non-Jewish court, it has no relevance. This is what? It's based on the intellect. It's rational thinking. It's ethical. It's moral. Maybe all that. But it's not divine. It's not absolute. And for the Jew to live his life not within the context of absolute because a person is prone to vacillate from, because a person's intel intellect is limited Ultimately, what does it lead to? It leads to heresy. <coughs> Over here, the Balaturim, we read in, in the previous portion the mitzvah of building an altar. Mizbach Adomatasali, which make an earthen altar means that even the altar that was made of copper, it should be filled with earth. Or when we have stone, Mizbeach, in the base of Migdosh, what was it? It was made of stone. You're not permitted to use a metal implement to cut the stone. Because it says in the Torah, <laughs> because you allowed your sword, iron, to come upon the stone, it's invalidated. Because what is, what is iron made for? To kill. The sword is kills. What is the Mizbeach? What's its value? It's to bring peace. So one is contrary to the other. Therefore, if you use the metal implement to cut the stone, the stone is invalidated. It cannot be used for the Mizbeach. It cannot be used. So the, he says over here, the tur why does the Torah juxtapose the building of the Mizbeach and the ramp going up to the Mizbeach to the portion of Mishpatim. Loma nisko parshas dinu parshas mizbeach. Lom lach shetosim Sanhedrin eitzel mizbeach. That what was the location of the Sanhedrin, the High Court of Israel, what we call Sanhedrin Gedola? It was adjacent to the sanctuary. It was in a chamber called the, the Chamber of Cut Stone, Lishkas Agosis. That's where they would convene. That is the value of the juxtaposition of Elo Mishpatim. The judicial system, the High Court of Israel, should be situated alongside the Mizbeach. So over here he says, just as it says, the Mizbeach, if you have the metal implement cutting the stone, the Mizbeach, the stone is invalidated. Can I use the Mizbeach? Should Sarachadai in Liros, Ki'ilu Cherv Menachas Lo Al Yurecho. The Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin. <coughs> Mm 
לעולם ירד דיון עצמו כי לחרב מנחס לו בן ירחוסו וגהנם פסוכו לא ביטחתו. A judge, when he sits in judgment, he has to see, visualize himself as if there's an, a sword, a sharp sword between his thighs, and as if Gehenna is open beneath him. What happens if he deviates? He moves as much as Nayota. He's cut in half by the sword. When a person judges, passes judgment, he has to have such a level of absolute clarity that he will not render that judgment unless he's certain that it it abides and it's fully credible. So only when he understands that his life is at risk, not only his physical life, but even his spiritual life, only then will he what? Will he render that correct judgment. That's the seriousness he has to understand of the consequence of doing the wrong judgment, get rendering the wrong. So he says over here, Omrav Shmuel bar Nachmani Omri Yonz called Dain Shadon Emes Lamito a judge who renders a, a judgment which is truthful, ultimately truthful, he causes the Divine Presence to dwell among Jews. Shenemar, as it says in the verse in the Pasuk, Elokim Nitzah Badaskel, God stands, establishes himself in the congregation of Kael, the care of Elokim Yishpot. V'kol Dayon she'en odon emes mito, but a Dayon who does not judge a truthful, or the ultimate truthful just judgment, Goreim Shechinah Shedestalik Mishra. He causes that the Shechinah should depart from the Jewish people. Quotes a verse, V'omer HaShemu Bar Nachma, Nom Rebbe Yonasa, Kol Dayin Shenolta Mizeh V'Nosid Lezeh Shlokadin, a Dayin, a judge who rules that the innocent party is guilty, and he causes that one should take from the other illegally, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Nolta Mimem Nafsho, HaShem will take his soul. Hashem will cause that dying to die, the judge to die. He takes, and we're not speaking of the amounts, even if he judges, rules that the innocent party must pay a small amount of money to the other, God says that dying's life will be taken. Why? If a person steals, there is no such consequence. There is no such consequence. But a judge who renders a false decision, judgment, his life is at risk. His life will be taken. What is the... What is the seriousness of rendering a judgment, a false judgment, and stealing? Stealing is serious, but it's not that you're going to forfeit your life. Here, by rendering a false judgment, his life will be forfeited. God will take his life. What's the seriousness of it? And also it says, Kol dayon shedon emes lamito, nasashutif ma'kodesh bochum masabreshis. The Gemara tells us that a person renders a truthful judgment, he becomes God's partner in creation. God says, you're my partner in creation. But uh, if not, I will take your life. You steal, God doesn't take your life. But rendering uh, corrupt judgment, God says, I will take your life. What's the difference? And also, what, what's the expression? Kodain shadon emes la mito. Kodain shadon din emes. What's din emes? A judgment which is truthful. It's the ultimate truth. What's the ultimate? E either it's truthful or not truthful. So regarding the expression emes lamito, it has to be the ultimate truth. So there's, Tosa says in Shabbos that the Gemara tells us in one location, in Shurs, let's say the evidence comes before the court and the defense, each one presents his case and they meet all the criteria which, which would establish that we're ready to give a ruling. But after everything is processed, and after all the interrogations, the judge has a sense there's something not right here. There's something which is not 100% right. He can't put his finger on it. The witness has passed the interrogation, but there's something, and he can't put his finger on it. The judge has to remove himself from the case. But it's emis. It meets all the criteria of truth, but the judge has a sense there's something not right. It's emis, but it's not emis lamito. That's called din maruma. It seems to be there's something not 100% straight here. So if he disqualifies himself, then that, so the only time he'll render a judgment if it's absolute truth, where he has no questions in his mind that this is really truthful. Only then does God consider you his partner in creation. Now why are you his partner in creation? So there's a Midrash in this week's, in this week's parasha. The Midrash tells us
Reb Leza Omer, Im Yej Din Lamaton, if there's justice on the terrestrial level, Ain Din Lamalon, then there's no divine justice. If there's human justice meeting God's criteria of what human justice is on the terrestrial level, God says you will not have divine justice. There may din lamaton, but if there is no justice on the terrestrial level, on the human level, yesh din lamaton, then there will be divine justice. Ketzad, im yasu atachtonim sadin milamato. If the human beings, those the terrestrial beings, will render judgment, justice below, ein hadin nasel milamalon. God will not cause divine justice. Omer afigo, omer akodesh baruch hu shimru. It's a mishpat. Therefore, Hashem, who warns us, make sure to abide by justice, by the laws of the court. Because I don't want you to, to cause me to render divine justice. He says, whatever I do, I do whenever is divine justice. I have a right to render that divine justice. Because God says, if I ever want to release that judgment, the attribute of justice, the world couldn't exist. We read at the beginning of creation, the appellation for justice is Elohim. Reishis bar Elohim. Elohim says, let there be light. Continuously Elohim. So Rashi cites the Midrash, that initially God wanted to create the world with Midas Adin, with the attribute of justice. But when he saw that the world would not be able to continue, it would be destroyed, he coalesced into judgment, Midas Arachmi. is the attribute of mercy. But what is the ultimate? What would be best for existence? There should be justice. If there's justice, you weed out all, all those who fail. You have a perfect existence. But we have a problem. Why, why, what's the problem? Most people are far from perfect. So if most people are far, far from perfect. Even the tzaddik, Shlomo says, a tzaddik, there's no perfect tzaddik. So if that's the case, even the non-perfect tzaddik has to be destroyed or has to be limited in a very serious way. So if that's the case, the world can't exist. Therefore, Hashem chose Midas HaRachmim, this is the attribute of, of mercy. But what would have been best in the perfect setting? Midas HaDim. But unfortunately, the world can't tolerate the attribute of justice. But what did Hashem say? Even though the world cannot tolerate divine justice, but minimally you have to have human justice. And who sets the criteria of human justice? HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He sets the parameters. What are the parameters of human justice? That's Elam Mishpatim, Hashem Tosim Lefneim. These are the laws of the judges. What is a credible judge? What is a judge who actually is qualified to render certain types of judgments? How many members have to go on each one of the courts? A three-member court, a 23-member court, a 71-level member court, different levels of courts. This is all set by Hashem. This is God. This is divine. But ultimately, the judgment that's set, the justice that is rendered, is human justice. Human justice, which meets the divine criteria, which the Torah sets. Why? Because you have to, the world has to have din. You have to have justice. Without justice, the world cannot continue. But what happens if human justice is not actually rendered? It's not rendered. What happens? But the world has to have justice. The world cannot function without justice. So if there's terrestrial justice, human justice, the world functions fine. But Hashem says, If there's no justice on the terrestrial level, but the world needs just needs din, needs din lamalo. Then there has to be divine justice. But what happens, Hashem says, if I allow divine justice to be unleashed, the world will not continue. So the judge who judges din emes la mito, it's not just a truthful justice. It's the ultimate, which the judge has no inkling or no concern that maybe the justice that's rendered is not absolutely truthful. And therefore he, he renders that, ju that, that verdict. He's God's partner in creation. Why? Because he's maintaining existence. Because if not for that justice, God says, then I have to implement my justice, which is divine. 
If there's divine justice, the world cannot continue. Therefore, you're God's partner in creation. What happens if a dying doesn't render a truthful justice? And he causes, he takes from the innocent party and gives it to the guilty party, which is corrupt justice. God says, I will take his soul. I will take, why? It's not a question of stealing. This is because you're undermining the principle of justice. The world cannot continue unless you have justice. You're tampering with existence. So it's what you're putting all existence into jeopardy. If that's the case, you deserve to die. Now it's interesting. We find something similar. Similar. We find that the Chavetz Chaim, in his introduction to his work, Chavetz Chaim, which discusses all the laws of Lashon Hara, speaking negatively about another person, critically of another person, where it has no constructive value whatsoever slandering another person, what we call Moti Shemra. So over there he quotes a Zohar in his introduction. And he says over there that <coughs> if a person chas v'sholem is in violation of Moshin Hara, it has very, very, very serious ramification and consequences. It brings death, it brings sword, it brings destruction upon the world. Why? Rosh Hashanah, this he doesn't say, just embellishing it to bring it out to another level, Rosh Hashanah is the Yom Adin. Day of Judgment. What does it mean with the Day of Judgment? I mean, whatever record we have in Rosh Hashanah, we have that record through the, throughout the year. Our record is imperfect. Nobody's perfect. Some people's record is less perfect than others. But everybody's record is imperfect. So, if it's imperfect, so why are we punished for that, for those failings on the record? It's recorded. Everything's recorded. So why are we punished? The answer is, because there's what we call Midas Arachim, the attribute of mercy. Hashem says, I'm willing, I'm patient. You do tshuva, you'll correct it, I'll give you endless chances. But what happens if the prosecutor, which what we call Sultan, is the prosecutor of the Jewish people, he begins prosecuting, and he's allowed to prosecute, and he can prosecute the record, what happens? Then we have a problem. The, throughout the year, Hashem, God, does not let the prosecutor prosecute. doesn't allow it. But if he's able to prosecute, what is the consequence of prosecution? The attribute of justice. Then Hashem releases the attribute of justice. Therefore, there's death and there's suffering, an untold suffering on the world. That's what happens. So throughout the year, Hashem doesn't allow the prosecutor to prosecute. But we could evoke prosecution. Rosh Hashanah is the Yom Hadin. One day a year, Hashem allows the sultan to prosecute the record. But we have something, we're able to silence the sultan. What is that? That's the shofar. The, the shofar, the schus of the akedah, the merit of the akedah Yitzchok, how Avraham Avinu was willing to sacrifice his own son and be totally negated to the will of Hashem, that silences the prosecution of sultan. That's what happens. That's, the save, that's what saves us from the prosecution of sultan. Okay? But what happens if you evoke prosecution during the year, and the prosecutor begins prosecuting. How do you silence him? You can't. You can't silence him. So what happens? If he prosecutes, there could be very serious consequences and ramifications. Suffering, untold suffering. So the person who speaks Lashon Hara, what's his level of culpability? It's similar to the Dayan who did not render that truthful justice. Judgment. If you, I will take your soul. Because you brought death on the world. Because without justice, what, what are you putting? You're putting the world into jeopardy. Because So if you rendered a judgment which is not correct and you actually caused the innocent party to pay what he shouldn't have paid, it's corrupt. What you did is corrupted. So God says, but the world has to have justice. It cannot be maintained without justice. And if there's no terrestrial justice, human justice, then there has to be divine justice. We find that HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed Stom and Amora. You know, what, you know what, what kind of justice was in Stom and Amora? You can imagine what kind of justice. The Amora give, give, depicts, gives a number of depictions of what was there. That the innocent party was guilty and the guilty party was innocent. That went on in Stom and Amora. The Gemara tells us that Eliezer, the servant of Abram, visited Sodom. So he's, he's walking down the street, a person comes with a club and a corson. And 
hurts him. So what does he do? He takes him to court. Comes before the judge in Sidom, and he has says the man attacked me. He injured me. I want to be compensated for various for the injuries. So he says. So the judge says in Sidom, the victim pays the victimizer. That's Sodom, That's justice in Sodom. He's taken aback. I'm the victim. I have to pay the man who accosted me. He says, you know, so Eliezer was a very smart man, very smart man. So he says to his, his attacker, he says, can I borrow your club? So he goes and he accosts the judge. He injures the judge. He says, now you pay my debt. You understand? This was, this was, this was justice in Sodom. So, Sodom, could Hashem tolerate such existence? Even though the Pasuk says it's because they would not extend their hand toward the poor to that degree. But it was corrupt from Roin the Chatom Lashem the Oat. They sinned against man and God to a great degree. They recognized their maker and they defied him. It's as if, as if you don't exist. Hashem says, oh, I'm going to teach you I do exist. There's no human justice, then there's divine justice. And this is Tosav Lefneim. You have to have equitable, truthful justice. And if not, so therefore the judge, who is that equitable, truthful judge, what is he doing? Because of his integrity and his proficiency and his dimension of person, he's guaranteeing existence should exist. Therefore, the Gemara says, this man is God's partner in creation. That's the reason why he's God's partner in creation. The Torah, you would think, there's a Ramban here. We speak about Elam Mishpatim, and we speak about a person being sold into slavery for stealing. You would think, after Sinai, there's nothing, an, a, 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 another law we couldn't discuss. Let's talk immediately about the laws of Shabbos. Let's talk about the laws of Tefillin. Let's talk about other laws. The laws of, of charity. If a person should steal, here we're coming off a level of Nasev and Nishma. The Jew, Jews reached a level of the pinnacle in spirituality, and all of a sudden we start speaking about Kisig Nevet Ivri, a person who purchases a Jewish, a Hebrew slave who stole, and because he couldn't compensate the person he had stolen from, he has to be sold for his value into slavery. Why is that the first thing you have to see now? That's the first law that the Torah addresses. Why? So Ramban explains. A Jewish slave can maximally be sold for six years. When does when it go out in the seventh year? So we find the six, seven. Shabbos is six days weekday. Seventh day is what? Is Shabbos. Sabbatical year, it's also seven. What does seven represent? The first of the Aser Sadibris of the first Ten Commandments. Right? This is a fundamental belief. God took us out of Egypt. What do we have to remember? Every day, there's a mitzvah to remember that what? That we left Egypt. Jew has an obligation to remember that he was a slave in Egypt and God redeemed us from Egypt. So the whole idea of six days, six years a slave, the seventh year now you're being redeemed, you're being freed, you're being emancipated. So first you have two things. You have being redeemed from Egypt. You've been a slave and now you're redeemed. That's what the slave represents. The redemption, not, it's not the 6-7. Right, six days a week, weekday. Six days you work. The seventh day, we don't do work. He's emancipated from the servitude of his master, similar to the Shabbos. Six days were slaves, self-imposed slavery. Seventh day Hashem says, today you're free men. Today you're with me. You're no longer bound and you're not permitted to be involved with physical creative activity. 
So therefore, that's the reason why immediately after Sinai, because it represents Zech Litzis Mitzrayim, that Hashem redeemed you, the slave is emancipated after six years of servitude. In addition, the six seven is what? It's, it's, to, it's remembering Masa Bracious, because the order of six, a servitude, seventh, you cease working, similar six year servitude, the seventh year you're emancipated from the servitude of the master. That's the Ramban. That's why immediately after Sinai, because these are two fundamentals in Jewish belief, that's why this law is, is discussed. This is the Rambam. I was thinking slightly differently. We, we find that after Kri Yamsuf, when we witness the sea closing on the Egyptians, what does it say? It says, Vayimini Ba'ashem Moshe Avdo. After witnessing God's presence at the splitting of the sea, that what the maidservant had witnessed at the sea, even Yecheskel, the prophet, didn't witness. So what happened? How much, how long did it take for the Jews to say, Yesha Lukim is God in our midst or not? That why were we attacked by Amalek? We started complaining. We had, we had the mon. Afterwards, there was a shortage of water again. And so Hashem said to Moshe, strike the rock, and there'll be water. But what did Moshe say to, to the Jews? God already has proven himself to you. Why are you questioning God? Why are you testing God? And because you're testing God to ask, is God in your midst or not? But you have a Amalek. We were attacked by Amalek. But how, how, do you, how do you speak this way? We just were speaking about Vayimid Hashem Moshe Abdo. Hashem Yimlo They believed in, in God and Moshe's servant. After witnessing Kriya Shamsu. How long does it take to regress? It's a slippery slope. But you're at the heights, the heights of belief. Belief, even your, your, the revelation was greater than what Yechezkel Anovi saw, Yechezkel the prophet saw. So how long does it take to fall? Sinai, we reach the pinnacle of our spirituality. Nasev and Nishma. Forty days later, what were we involved with? With the golden calf. How long does it take to regress? What is the vulnerability of a Jew? So what the Torah is saying, even though you're coming off Sinai, the first thing we discuss, you have to understand your vulnerability. You're still a human being. You still have an evil inclination. A Jew, a human being, is never guaranteed. As it says, a, Jew can, a person cannot believe in himself until the day he dies. Until the moment you no longer exist, you're functioning, God forbid, a person can become a heretic. You cannot believe you're not secure in your position until you leave this world. We find that by the Ovis HaKadoshim, Hashem would not associate His name with even the Ovis HaKadoshim, with the Holy Patriarchs. But Heinei Nehmer they were the location of the Shechina. Could you imagine? But even them, until the last moment, God forbid, they become, they become deniers of God's existence. Except for Yitzchok, in his lifetime, because he was blind, he was, he was confined to the house, Hashem did, because he no longer had the Yitzhara. He was not subject to the evil inclination any longer. But outside of that, Avram and Yaakov, they were all, Hashem only said, I'm okay, Avram, I'm okay, Yaakov, only after they passed away. Could you imagine? Av, Yaakov was the Bechir Shabbos, he was the most special of the patriarchs. The answer is, Altam Vatzvat Yom Moscho. After Sinai, we've reached Memte Shari Tairo, the 29th gate of, 49th gate of purity. Hashem gave us, the, spoke to us, Ponim El Ponim, in a wake state we prophesied. But yet 40 days later, we could be involved with an ego, with the golden calf, which God wanted to destroy us. If not for Moshe's supplications of Hashem. Therefore, after Sinai, what do we discuss? Stealing. If you steal and you can't restitute, compensate the victim, you'll be a slave. But what kind of slave? Not a, not a Yis Evid Yisraeli. Evid Ivri. Evid Ivri. You know what Ivri is? So Rabbeinu Bachir says, why is he referred to as Evid Yisraeli? Because the behavior of this Jew, is he's a pre-Sinai Jew. What would we refer to? What was our classification of pre-Sinai? We call Ivrim. We're Hebrews. This man is still a Hebrew. He's living his life as if Sinai never existed. Could you imagine? You're at Sinai, you prophesy in a wake state, and you behave like a pre-Sinai -pre Jew, as if Sinai never happened. That's the level of regression a Jew could fall. 
Therefore, you have to be cognizant of our Achilles heel of a vulnerability in all these areas, and only by being cognizant of this are we able to maintain the level which we should.